Right. Hello, everybody. I'm Eija. I'm, I'm based in Helsinki in Finland. And just quickly introducing myself, I'm running with Anna, uh, the world's only global association representing education and research in our disciplines, art, design and media. Uh, Kumulus was founded in 1990 by University of Art and Design in Helsinki, in Finland, and that is the school in Aalto University in Finland hosting our secretary. That you understand the, the context, kind of one we try to give us an umbrella to all of you. Uh, Kumulus has been once endorsed by UNESCO. Um, we have roughly 340 members from 61 countries. Um, uh, we also collaborate roughly with 50 uh, institutions that uh, represent knowledge by profession, business, industry, NGOs, etc., etc. And if me, we all together are successful, we can reach over 1 million people, students, academics, staff members at the universities via our social media, via our, our partners, how do you say, uncountless un number of guys on this planet, I hope in the space as well. We share knowledge, best and worst practices. I'm always uh, adding worst practices. We learn from each other um, and having strong focus in design and media, but re respecting arts as roots for everything. I'm an art historian by myself and have also business degree, so I'm a mix, I'm a big mix guy. Um, what we do, okay, making people be together, thanks to COVID, we are here online. We have conferences, hopefully can meet many of you next year, June, uh, 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 also celebrating our 30 years um, anniversary. The group, this Eating Habits, was launched a year ago in Finland during a conference, and Dolly has been one of the freaks with Rahul and Lolita that we created this group and it's partly also kind of my job. I've been committed to Cumulus 30 years so let's celebrate that together somewhere in India or wherever in the planet. That that because in L'Ecole de Design in North France where Jolly is working based they have a special uh, program on food and back to some some roots behind early 2000, roughly 2004 or something, we applied funding from the European Union source called Knowledge Alliances, two times with fantastic consortium of universities and businesses, not only limited to European Union. Um, I was so sad that we didn't become funded, but here we are today, so this is much more. We have roughly 100 members in our Facebook group, Thanks for all of you that are in Facebook, whatever your opinion about it is. And um, on behalf of Kumulusians, I have to say this, and all our, our friends, we are interested in being alive also by food that is more and more becoming uh, crucial in education and research in our disciplines. And we are part of the environmental crisis, so I guess this uh, this soil can accelerate many good things on the planet. So thanks for, I'm, I'm as an admin following you guys. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Ia, and thank you, Anna. This working group and these seminars and the carrot bar and everything else and all the initiatives, the crazy ideas that I come up with <laughs> would not have been possible without your support. Um, you know, and you, you are a gift to, I can say you're a gift to design, you're a gift to Cumulus because I, at any morning I actually can send an, I send an idea to Ia and I would still haven't woken up to actually think properly about the idea and Ia would say, wonderful, let's do it. <laughs> so thank you so much for your support and uh, for believing in all of us all over the world. You're the connector of design, professions all over the world. So thank you. And to introduce myself, my name is Dolly Dow. I actually work at L'Ecole de Design as a director of Food, um, Des food Design Lab. Um, and I do a lot of work between um, the 
science of food and the science of design, <laughs> because at the end of the day, you've got art and design together, and they're both sciences. Um, and we work with the mission of how to feed the planet. And when we thought of world domination, we said, why not combine the efforts of EA, the expertise of EA, of dominating the planet with design already, um, Raul and Lolita. And I'll get Lolita to tell the story of how this kind of collaboration happened <laughs> into, uh, into this uh, working group. Can I ask you guys to meet your, phone, your microphone if you don't mind for the clarity of the voice? So can I ask everyone? Otherwise, I'm mute you. I will mute you. Mute. Uh, Aman, can you... Uh, um, yeah, everybody is muted. Mute your phone, microphones, please, so we can, we can give you a clear presentation. <laughs> so, what is this all about? The carrot bar came from an idea, actually the name is EAS. We can give credit to EAS for the name, <laughs> the carrot bar. And we thought of monthly webinars where professions from all over the world and academians can share the food stories. So we don't want very high academic papers that is going to change the world. Just share your food stories with us because by simple stories, we can discover culture. We can discover each other's um, journeys. Um, we've decided to actually work on a project that is potentially can become a research project. As Ea said, that um, the school, my school, and Cumulus and other schools have actually embarked onto a design, a food design project, a research project a while ago. But we can actually embark on it um, again um, in the following months. We have thought of a research project that is called Breadcrumbs. And the idea is to follow breadcrumbs all over the continent, looking for food stories and cultural stories. We want to start with bread because it's a culture, it has a connotation of cultural identity, but it could emerge into something else. We were discussing the politics of bread, the spirituality of bread. So when we talk about bread, we're not just talking about the dough, we are talking about everything that is behind that dough to make it possible and make it available to the masses. So I'm going to start straight away with my presentation. I'll share my screen. Here's something I prepared earlier for you. And so I'm going to basically read a, um, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. I'm going to actually basically, can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. The presentation or the PowerPoint? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And now you see the, just bear with me for one second. So basically I'm going to be sharing a, uh, the bread story of, bear with me for one second, following bread stories across continents. So, if we have to think of bread, bread is actually a research project. Um, Breadcrumbs is a research project. It follows bread stories all across continents. So if we actually looking at storytelling, bread is the perfect storytelling um, that we could actually, that, that reveal the identity of cultures. It has an arbitrary meaningfulness and to human existence. Throughout history, it's always been a symbol of existence and survival. In modern times, abundance of bread is associated with a healthy economy and people's livelihood. Hence, bread became associated with the national identity and pride. From the Indian roti, to Lebanese pita, to the French baguette, to the croissant, each narrate a story of their creation through migration and immigration more so human morphology. When people go from one continent to the next, they take their daily habits with them. This is the story that we're going to be telling you today. We follow the breadcrumbs of each bread story in order to understand the, the value of this integral food in our everyday life. How we're eating bread, winning bread, making bread, 
breaking bread determines how we live our lives. We are visiting our daily lives in order to understand the value of the oldest food practices in the world. Normally, the recipe of bread is no big deal. Just, few just a flour from a grain, water, perhaps yeast, and salt. However, the technique changes the identity of the bread and changes the way we eat the bread. During the COVID-19 pandemic, bread and breadwinning became a common global concern. How to feed the, the billions became a priority with the rising concern of food security and affordability. Wheat being one of the highest investment commodities in the world became more than ever a symbol of survival associated with the national identity, especially in underdeveloped countries, which includes the cultural, political, and religious identity. Supply and demand determine the price of wheat, determined by the government, agricultural policies. So more than so, the agricultural policies that, we, um, that is set by the government determines our daily habits and the sustainability of hunger or not in the world. So where does the actual wheat story comes from or the bread story comes from? Are they associated? Is wheat the same? When we talk about wheat, are we talking about bread or are we talking about a grain or the grain? And which grain of wheat are we talking about? Because there are so many. So from Shubaika, um, this is the oldest bread crumbs that were discovered in the world. So Shubaika is basically, you can see it on the screen, very close to Lebanon, very close to Beirut. This is where the pita bread originated from. That was the first story review of the pita bread, 12,400 BC. Imagine, 4,000 years ago. So hence, from there came, give us our, the prayer came, give us our daily bread. And it's not just associated with the prayer of let us, let us eat bread every day, but let us eat every day. Let us survive every day. That was before the actual start of agriculture. So just like a good design process, the bread as we know it now, the pita bread, uh, was discovered by accident. <laughs> so it could be by accident or it could be by intelligent experimentation. So they've made the dough from the, um, from the grain, from the water, salt, kneaded the dough, and then they discovered fire. The dough was next to the fire, placed the two stones on top of each other, and then they've created the flat bread. And then the sourdough bread came in later. The sourdough bread came from the Egyptians, also by accident, as many design, many design inventions <laughs> around us. So the Egyptians discovered the sour bread, which is the basis of the baguette. And then the Greeks invented the profession, the baker. So the traveling pita means aish in uh, Arabic, which means life. So when we are eating, we are giving people life. And it means also anan in Sumerian, which means the gift. So we actually giving people, when we give bread to people, we are giving them the gift of life. So the ingredients of, the, of making Lebanese pita is the same as the ingredients of making roti. The technique and is different. The ingredients are similar. Technique is different, experimentation is different, identity is different, symbolism is the same. The national identity of survival and existence of the masses. So when we are actually talking about bread here, we are talking about the Sumerian word which goes back to uh, 3600 BC. And that is the actual meaning of bread. So if you think about it, when I actually started researching this, I was going to um, pretty much research the, the history of bread, not realizing that 
what I was actually researching was human existence because I discovered that bread making is determined by um, similar to design. I discovered that bread making is actually determined by three principles, materiality, technique, and technology, which determines its purpose, form, and hence its identity and symbolism. So researching bread is pretty much similar to, um, to water. It's researching the lifeline of human existence. And it's similar to design. It's only there, it's always there, but when it's not there, this is when it's missed. So what is the difference between the pita, the roti, and the baguette? The technique, the form, and the function. Very much similar to design. So when we are kneading the dough, when we are making the dough, we are actually into the methodology of a design process. In France, the bread has a different connotation. It's actually called the bread of equality. And it was discovered in, um, around after the revolution, 1793. So the actual agreement was this, richness and poverty must both disappear from the government of equality. It will no longer make a bread of wheat for the rich and a bread of bran for the poor. All bakers will be held under the penalty of imprisonment to make only one type of bread, the bread of equality. So in the past, the rich ate the white bread, the poor ate the brown bread. I'm just going to put a question there, provocative question. Which bread are we eating now? Because right now the brown bread is more expensive than the, the white bread. So what's in the white bread? Is it still the actual grain of the wheat or is it the essence of the wheat? What is the technique of making bread now that is allowing us to, to have um, all of these allergies from wheat? Are we still eating wheat in the white bread? Just a provocative question for you to think about. And the actual baguette also is a symbol of survival here and a symbol of national identity in France because even um, Emmanuel Macron said, it's our national symbol for which we are envied by many countries. So we are envied by many, many countries because the smell of baguette in the morning as you actually walking um, around the Parisian streets or the French streets has a romanticism and has a um, symbolism to, to it that is associated with the French design, if you think, or the French way of life. So when people dream of a croissant, eating croissant in Paris, they're not just dreaming about that croissant, they're dreaming about the experience that they're going to feel walking around the, uh, the, the French streets um, and eating part of history. And this is why the actual baguette is envied by others because it's a French design um, way, if you like. And the baguette, the actual form of the baguette itself is a, um, a, a great example of the form follows function, the idea of the ideal of the form follows function in, in designing the dough to create what, what we need because the actual uh, ingredients of the baguette is the, are the same also as roti, you know, salt, water, but you've got the sourdough um, uh, in there. The form, there's a myth around it, which goes back to the Napoleon time that in order for the bread to fit into the pockets of soldiers, they've created this type of form for the bread. Hence, also associating the, the, the function of the bread for the soldiers with its biological uh, need for, for survival and for eating. And of course, we can't talk about the French bread without talking about the croissant. <laughs> the croissant basically revolutionized uh, breakfast for French and for many people. Again, it's made from millefeuille, same techniques, same, uh, same, same uh, recipe, but different techniques. So here, instead of baking the entire dough entirely without flattening the bread, we flatten the bread, we put butter in between to create layers and layers and layers of doughs in order for us to make the croissant, which is part of Le Petit Pain that was discovered by an Austrian gentleman 
in 1838-1839. So here I'm going to actually leave you with some provocations. What I've just given you is um, just an appetizer for the bread, for the bread um, history, if you like, and the bread connotation and symbolism, because I would leave Lolita and Raul to talk more about the meaningfulness of bread in the, in the Indian culture. But I'm going to leave you with some provo provocative questions, if you like. Um, the first one is going to be, I'm just going to talk about the bread a little bit, the bread story. So when bread is too expensive to eat, what does that mean to the nation? It's an unhealthy economy. Um, it, it, it connotates an unhealthy economy and national management. This means to the community that their identity is under threat. Identity being linked to a biological, biological as well as national existence and survival. If bread perishes, so will we. Bread remains part of our banal life, everyday existence and habits. Silent on our table until we feel its scarcity. Then the, the biological human instinct kicks in. When this source becomes threatened, or more symbolically, when our breadwinning becomes threatened, then the symbol of bread takes a different role and becomes an extraordinary guest on our ordinary table. I leave you with questions. What is the new symbolism of the bread grain? And I'm not talking about any grain, I'm talking about the grain, wheat, or maybe rice. Is rice the new grain, the new wheat? It's always associated with the existence, with the human existence, but now more than ever, it's actually associated with our planet survival. We have to choose planet survival or human existence because we know very well how, how much space wheat needs to grow and the cost of distribution of that wheat and the cost of that wheat being a commodity and a monopolizing force amongst many nations. So what are the social, economical, political, and environmental costs of growing certain varieties of wheat and rice? When I say certain, it means that we have lost at least a ground from the, from the existence of wheat till now, 500 varieties, and we are only growing certain varieties of wheat and certain varieties of rice. So what is the cost of wheat, of bread, to our human existence and the existence of planet. Which one do we choose? And I leave you with this provocation to actually go on to the video of Lolita. Thank you, Dolly. That was very provocative. Yes, indeed. It, I'm sure, is going to leave everybody with a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to show you a short video, which I will show you in a short while on roti, which is the classic Indian wheat bread. And as Dolly said, it also has a history and it comes from, a, which we could see in the video, it comes from uh, a migration process from Central Asia and also from East Africa. These are the two theories that went behind the Indian bread. Now the Indian bread, which is roti, is also synonymous with other words with which the Indian people relate to, which is chapati, hulka, puri, luchi, paratha, and naan. Now these are all synonymous with the word roti and also with the making, the process of roti, which is all these are differently made in the different parts of India. India has a very diverse culture and north, south, east, west. Roti is primarily eaten in the north, because if we look at the migration process, it did come into the north first. And then it filtered more towards the western part of the country and a little bit to the southern part of the country and a little bit to the eastern part of the country. So in India, roti is primarily eaten mainly in North India, uh, not much in South India, but yes, on the western sides of India, the western coastline part of India, one part of it, and a little bit in the Eastern India, but eaten differently with different accompaniments. Roti is in India actually the humble man's diet, but it can also become the rich man's feast. So 
we can have a variety of rotis for our weddings and various ceremonies and rituals that we have. But it is the most primary, most primeval, I would say, uh, symbolism of the poor man's existence. And when I decided to make the short film and I decided that we were going to work on this project, um, I knew that it wasn't going to be easy because it was during the time of the pandemic and there were a lot of restrictions. And um, I said, okay, save this somehow because roti in, in the Indian context actually is also um, three basic things that we look for in our survival. One is food, one is shelter, and one is the, um, the food, food, sorry, food, shelter, and clothing. So clothing and shelter, we have to get from somewhere. Food is the most basic thing to survive. If we don't have food, we don't survive. If we don't have bread, if we don't have what we call roti over uh, here. Indian... Um, can I talk to you about something? I don't know if you checked the mail. Can you please mute yourself? I don't talk to the Indian Patela. Can you please mute, you mute yourself? I've lost the context. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, so anyway, without much ado, I'm going to ask. So I had three undergraduate students who helped me put the short film together. And we had to work in these very uh, adverse conditions because at that point, we just could not get out and do anything. So I'm going to ask one of them, I think it's Aryan, who's going to, in one minute, tell you the experience they had while they did this short film with me. So over to you, Aryan. You can share your little story. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Aryan Abhishek. I'm a student in visual education from Karnavati University in Gujarat, India. It has been a very fun journey and a great learning experience making the video with my friends Aritra Singha and Atharva Mani. With the guidance and support of Lalita ma'am under these harsh circumstances of this pandemic. She explained the whole concept in detail and provided us, provided us with the script for the video. One of the biggest hurdles was the finding of different video clips and images, especially since we couldn't record on our own. Much in this COVID situation, having no facilities to go out. However, with consultation of Lalita ma'am, me and two of my batchmates, we stitched the story together. We compiled the video over ma'am's voiceover, which again she had to do without any recording. We added the music and had many Zoom meetings with her to have the corrections and modifications done, which ma'am has told us. After overcoming the hurdles and many edits later, we have this end result. And we are happy to have this opportunity as a learning process. We hope you like it. Thank you, Aryan. I'm going to ask. Uh... Mahi to share the video and then I will conclude with a few things that I would like to say thereafter. So Mahi, can you share the video, please? Yes. Um... Can you see the screen? Yeah, but we are seeing Steve Jobs. Starting. August का तो उसका सीधा है और एक पूजा कल करवानी है है ना रुद्राविष्ट तो काले हाँ हाँ काले काले मारो छोकरों नो जन्मदिन छे तो एम नो कराऊँ चुना काकुली मैम काकुली मैम so starting yeah In the early months of April, with the advent of spring, undulating burnished wheat fields are harvested in the plains of northern and central India. Wheat is milled and ground and gives rise to atta, which is made into dough and rolled out as roti or pulka or chapati, all synonymous with the Indian flatbread. A large majority of the Indian population consumes roti on a daily basis, making it, after rice, the second staple in our food habits. 
The origins of roti are rooted in our ancient Vedic texts and have reference as an agricultural crop in the Indus Valley civilization. It is sometimes thought that the roti had its beginnings in India from a trade route in East Africa or Persia in Central Asia. Given the diversity of India and different cultures, the humble roti is seen not only as the common man's diet, but finds a place in feasts and festivals. Eaten with a variety of gravies, from lentils to meats to vegetables and chutneys, it is also symbolic as an identity, simply eaten with an onion and green chili. This use roti as a symbol of Indian food habits. Today, as we battle a pandemic, a large percentage of our migrant workers who are suffering hail the roti as an identity, exemplifying their basic need. The story of the humble yet ubiquitous roti continues with other grains as its base, like millet, bajra, and ragi. As the sun sets over wheat fields, we would await another harvest, another life cycle of the simple Indian wheat bread, which throughout our eating cultures finds a place in all our homes. Thank you, Mahi. So as Dolly said, I think I will also leave everybody with the questions of where does this identity take us? Why is bread so important for existence? What is the story behind bread? What are the many, many stories behind bread? And as I said, it's eaten differently in different parts of the country. It's made differently in different parts of the country. It symbolizes different things in different parts of the Indian continent. And yet, it travels like bread travels, everything travels. It travels across oceans, it travels across seas, and it finds a place in the heart of many that we have, you know, who eat it. And the story for me is actually far from over. I'm still very much researching and very working to deeper meanings and connections with the humble wheat bread that we call roti. I'm going to end with a few lines which I think are just you know, again, provocative. It says, bread takes the effort of kneading, but also requires sitting quietly while the dough rises with a power all of its own. Thank you for being with us today. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Rahul, who has another presentation for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, Jolly Lolita, for this passing of threads around bread and breadcrumbs. And uh, so I also do uh, bring on to the carrot bar a video to share to everyone. But uh, a little bit uh, giving the context. So Initially, as Dolly and I started talking on Facebook, and then Lolita Ma'am joined us on email, the idea of creative research also was always there alongside us as we were uh, talking about food and eat eating habits. And uh, then as we were talking and we moved towards the idea of a carrot bar, uh, it came to me that uh, I wanted to work with video as a medium and to kind of carry forward the spirit and the challenge of uh, creative research, making, building, and archiving. And that time, of course, I had no idea how long the lockdown will continue and how long we would be kind of pinned down and quarantines would come and stay forever. We had no idea, right? I decided to make a video. At the same time, ever since COVID happens, every time, food, when I, for me, Northeast of India, have always played a very important uh, role in, in instigating me to imagine food alternatively. And it has come through my own personal experience, my personal journeys into that region. So as we were talking about new eating habits, I knew it in my heart that I wanted to tell the story from the North East of India. You know, and then uh, 
as we were talking about carrot bar, uh, Dolly brought in uh, breadcrumbs and, and uh, Dolly tried, Dolly put bread as the metaphor around through which the storytelling will happen. And, uh, and that just instigated something very fascinating in me, like uh, my experience with bread. And in fact, bread, it becomes a very important metaphor through which I discover an alternative uh, food system in, in the Northeast, right? And as we began to work in the carrot bar, um, I kind of got in touch with Mahi, uh, my my uh, very very new first year foundation student, and instigated a collaboration. And uh, I think I'll first hand it over to Mahi at the stage, and then Mahi, you introduce yourself, you play our video, and then I'll then after the video, then I can continue the presentation. Hi, I'm Mahi Lakhani. I'm a first year student at UID. And as challenging and as interesting it was to make this video over various Zoom calls and WhatsApp voice notes with Rahul sir, it was kind of funny because I am a gluten intolerant and creating a video um, about uh, something around breadcrumbs was very very interesting and uh, funny and i got to know a uh, part of india which is the northeast which is um, which has a completely different uh, food culture which is not just gluten free but also a lot of other things so as um, i hope this video uh, broadens your horizons as it did for me when i first uh, conceived the idea with rahul sir So we will see this student who we are coming to the presentation. Okay. Um, is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible, but um, I would just like to say at this moment as well that can everybody please mute themselves? There are a couple of participants who are muted. All right, let's start. Years ago, when I traveled deep into the northeast of India, I realized that I was moving across eating habits in a major way. It was not like the normal transition into regional food ecologies. It was like entering a port of, portal of alternate food ecologies. Never thought I would yearn for bread so much. Jim, where's the bread? What you seek, seeks you. And well, I found bread. But the, this one was very light and sweet. Megalan rice shagri bread called pulkin. Kohima. The capital of Nagaland stands famous for its World War II history, the decisive battle that finally stopped the Japanese advance to India in 1944. Point being, it marks where the British Army was bringing in dining tables and bread from Bombay. By the time they could properly set up dining tables in Nagaland, India had its tries with destiny. But it's not that Nagaland didn't have its own bread, you know. This is Kemenia. It's a yummy sticky rice bread, which I discovered in a friend's house in Kohima. And like its cousin from Meghalaya, it completely changed my perception of bread. And that is Kura, a steamed and fried buckwheat pancake-like dish. It is had along with 
butter ghee. Pause. And I paid rupees 500 at a fancy cafe for the same gluten-free buckwheat pancake in Mumbai. This discovery of various breads across various parts of the Northeast took me to a zone where food is more made at home than bought somewhere. How it is stored, how through fermentation, drying, it is processed, how that is a eating culture that is so sustainable. White bread. Right. Yeah. So, so you can obviously understand that uh, I'm not again. I'm getting into uh, heterogeneous pockets of culture, right? Traveling into various kind of portals, and uh, but but the northeast. Uh, one of the things I would like to say before we move on is that this video is very much a work in progress. Uh, I mean, a lot of footages have been coming from friends, integrated, sounds have been picked up, integrated, some of the stock images have still remained, they will eventually be replaced, more footnoting, more crediting will happen, music design will also improve, so maybe some other time that sharing will also happen. Right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, the reason why this video uh, is that, and this for me, the Northeast threw up the same kind of provocations that Dolly brought in today. And uh, so when I kind of traveled there, I realized that you come to a place that we that you just don't go out and buy things. When you want something to eat something, it is, it is there in your house. It is there either in your back garden, you're, you're eating a banana from your garden, or you're, you're cooking some meat that you have grown and you have stored, you, you have mentored. Either neighbors make a lot of bread and share it around. And uh, the church plays a very important role in the sense of community building. And uh, that got me interested, like in design, we, that in design for me, um, designing systems is something that is really getting, uh, that I'm really getting interested in. So uh, when we talk about food and sustainability, uh, supply chains, uh, the from origin to the mouth, the way how the distance the food travels, uh, these elements have become extremely important to our imagination of uh, sustainability in food. The other thing that was very important, which again came up in my discussions with Mahi quite a lot, is that. Uh, Almost uh, like coming in from uh, Bengal, or if you're coming from Delhi, if you're coming from Bombay, we take certain things like uh, a milk or a lassi or a paneer or a bread or a roti uh, for, for granted, you know. And we also know that as we uh, go towards uh, across regions, we have variations. So when you go to South India, you know that you're getting into the land of parothas and you know, when you're coming into uh, um, Gujarat, you know that you have other varieties of rotis like rotlas and that kind of stuff. But for the first time, I walked into a land in India where it was just not there. And at just at that moment when I thought that it was not there, I came across food that let, that, uh, let me completely reimagine what I understood as, uh, say, something like a bread or something like a roti. And... Uh, in the Northeast, when we associate bread with breakfast, in a typical Northeastern breakfast, you have a lot of rice. And the, the kind of food we were seeing today in the video is something that you normally have in the evening as a snack. So as Lolita Ma'am brings us into India, we come into a territory where uh, rice could also be the metaphor for bread. Because when you say bread earner, 
in many places it's a rice earner you know and um, and as dolly also provoked us like is rice the next bread and also because in the east of india the lands of the farms are very small in the west of india we have large farms which allow for a lot of wheat to grow small farms support better rice agriculture so those kind of provocations and how we kind of imagine food circulate food talk about food and design food that is what i want to bring on to the table for campus i think we go to our moderator to sum it up for us and throw it up for the audience thank you. We, we have shown a uh, we have traveled across the continents so basically every time that the bread hits a new country it evolved and transformed into a new identity so how did it transform why this is the the story of humanity that that is the breadcrumb so we just want to open the floor now to questions and if you've got any questions you would like to ask any comments Right, we can go on home. Let's, let's leave. <laughs> um, I've got one question. Yeah, go for it. Um, just considering the identity of flatbread, and you talked about um, how poor people eat the brown bread and, um, uh, sorry, and richer people eat white bread. I was wondering about corn and maize, for example, the tortilla. Hmm. What role would that play in this kind of project? That would play a role, Shonali. That would definitely play. I mean, I think we've just looked at one part of the world. So if we take mm -hmm. the whole story further across, I think that's the research we are talking about. That's and that's the research Dolly was talking about, right? Yeah. So you have stories and that's a great insight you know cornbread tortillas and you mexican have different kinds of bread uh, south america also does have a bread culture and uh, if we begin to put these stories together is actually what we'll get so that's that's lovely so you can in fact work on that if you'd like to sure <laughs> this, this is exactly awesome. what the breadcrumbs is is um, is looking for because you've got the corn and remember that I've asked the question about what is the new grain, but there are actually grains because you've got the quinoa, you've got the soya, mm -hmm. you have uh, the corn, you have the wheat, you have the rice, and they all need a large number of um, vast spaces and a lot of water to grow. So what is the new grain? That's yeah. great. So we started with, uh, this is just an appetizer, as we said, we started with the flat bread, a little bit of the, even with the French bread, I have not even provoked all the regions in France because every, every region makes its uh, baguette and its um, um, you know, sweets differently. We've just started the first breadcrumb of this project. That's really cool. Um, Do Dolly, one, I think to lead on to Shadali's uh, question, it just reminded me of our um, uh, discussion uh, during our prep meeting about how the modernism or the industrialization spreads wheat across the world in a way that today, after a hundred years, we have to step back and ima reimagine various the varieties possible in bread outside the idea of the white bread, which has just become the definitions through advertising, through Hollywood, through it's just become the popular imagination of bread, right, all over the world, yeah. and then. And then we need, and that creates an area for us to kind of go back and remember bread, like in various, various ways. Absolutely. Any more questions you would like to ask about the breadcrumbs? Any ideas about the next breadcrumb? Nope. Don't be shy. But he's hungry. Everyone's hungry. Is it is it lunchtime or dinner time in it's dinner time in India now, right? Getting close to dinner time in India, not anywhere near dinner time. <laughs> we have a question on the chat box, Tony. Yeah, we do. We've got I'm interested in the idea of connecting eating habits such as bread consumption to the global issues of today. 
and other social um, yes absolutely this is where the connection is so if you think about it we're not making this uh, we're, we're making this presentation as an eye-opener for the developed countries but also as a leeway to how can we help with the underdeveloped countries or the countries that rely heavily on bread and breadwinning so absolutely if you've got um if you've got um Guilherme, if you've got any ideas please would love to hear from you would love to hear your comment Yes, uh, I, I'm Gemma, actually. My full name is Guilherme. So uh, I'm just actually, uh, there is, it's already uh, 9.30 in our country. So I joined because I'm interested. I think food connects everyone, uh, the, the, the staple. Uh, you know, as you said, as, as Dolly had said, and also Lolita, it, this, this is the reflection of our society, reflection of human history in the ordinary, the food uh, touches the, the gut. So parang everybody connects to food, regardless of uh, nationality. Yeah. But I'm interested in um, how, how can we, um, as designer or food designer, or change the habits and values so that, uh, not to reverse, but uh, siguro to lessen the effect of yung uh, irrigation and agriculture that has, uh, you know, um, uh, redefined the, the landscape, how land use, how uh, consumption, how uh, certain, um, um, uh, what do you call this, factors of production are concentrated in order to produce a certain a particular uh, kind or species of wheat or uh, a particular uh, species of rice. Because uh, it, we know that the that these habits are a contributor to the uh, economic divide and also yung offshoot niya to the uh, to the environment. So, how can designers uh, contribute to this changing of uh, consumption pattern when it is so entrenched into society? Parang, I cannot imagine people just giving up white bread or brown bread just as easily. In fact, we know that the shift from white to brown is actually a lifestyle uh, a lifestyle indicator more than health uh, issues. You know, it's uh, fashionable to be eating brown rice than white rice and brown bread rather than bread. So, this uh, has something to do with uh, particular uh, consumer behavior and it's uh, uh, I don't know if the designers are partly to blame uh, for packaging a certain image of this uh, 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 everyday uh, things that we consume on a daily basis, like bread is everyday. Yeah. So it's so insurance so because they are staple. So while they uh, reflect the kind of society that we have, um, can how can designers, uh, you know, affect some change when the culture is so entrenched? I mean. I would say the worst thing you can ever say to people, change your habits. The first thing that you would get when you, you say that to people is resistance. We've always done it that way, we're not going to change. The best way to change people's habits is not to tell them that you're changing their habits, but to show them the benefits. Not to talk about it, but to show them the benefits. So if we know, for example, no one talks about the fluffy white bread. The fluffy white bread is made by, by a process called crackling to the wheat, where you get, you take the nutrition, that's why you're getting allergies, uh, gluten allergies and other allergies, where you take the nutritional values of wheat so you can, the wheat can be kind of um, more inclined to have air bubbles in it. So you can have those nice, um, you know, bubble uh, voids inside the bread. And people think that it's fresh bread and it tastes good because it's nice and crunchy not realizing the nutritional value that they're losing in that bread. So the best way to show, to, to ask people to change their habits is to show them the benefits, to educate them. Um, media campaigns, we know that there are uh, 10 distributors around the world that decide what to eat, who, well, where to eat, what products to eat, which variety to eat, and they're kind of monopolizing um, all the food distribution around the world. So if you educate people into how you know uh, what are the best practices to eat 
And without even doing that during the pandemic, we've noticed here in France, there was a high level of awareness into the local products where people wanted to buy local in order to, uh, to support the circular economy. And we could see this trend because food is a trend, unfortunately, but it is. <laughs> um, we could see this trend all around Europe that people were going towards local food because they had more time to think about what they're eating. They slowed down their lives, you know, and then the market was responding to that. So not just as designers do we have the power, we have the power as consumers to decide. This is where it starts from. And then design comes into it with food design in terms of um, supporting local economy, supporting ecological practices, saying no to plastic, saying no to packaging that, um, that does not show what's in the ingredients, create awareness of 10% of fish, fresh fish in this, you can write that on the packaging, low sugar food because sugar is not good for you, creates many diseases, it creates, so create that awareness through the design process and through the design um, um, uh, how can we say the design awareness we have so much power and we're giving that power away and we, we call it marketing but it's not marketing it's actually design <laughs> we should take that that power designers, we, as designers we are in the in the chair where we can as exactly what dolly said is is the creating awareness aspect and the way that you can create so the different mediums or methods that you use to create that awareness is where we step in in creating a uh, or is very different from just being, you know, whatever. And another maybe role that we can maybe play as designers is to also use design thinking as a as a process to look at systems of how food is being manufactured, stored, processed, and uh, maybe design alternative systems, design and propose and prototype uh, sustainable food ecosystems. And it would be interesting design challenges to take up, right? To work with the town somewhere and and design a sustainable food ecosystem around that town, uh, without, as Dolly said, without um, taking that uh, activist uh, position of saying that you you need to change, yeah, no, but yeah. to but to be but to be like holding hands together in a journey. Yeah, you know? but even with. And, strategies for example like this is what we do at L'Ecole de Design we don't just like uh, we, we, we have uh, students that went into food businesses to help innovate the business strategy of that business so to, to create a shift but I'll go further than design thinking right we have to say design methodology because design thinking is for the enterprise now I'm thinking design tomorrow I'm not but design methodology is a way of life you know, it's breathing and eating for us. I agree. I agree. So yeah. Design methodology more than design thinking. And to integrate design methodologies more and more into our activities around food, actually, at, at every level, like from packaging to Thomas. Has, Thomas wanted to say something, I feel. Thomas? <laughs> you put you on the spot. You have to say something now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, actually, I was not, <laughs> but, but I can, I can say something. Um, I, I find it really, really, uh, it, it just makes me, what you're talking about just makes me think because I'm, I'm from Scandinavia and, and Raul, interesting that you say when you, for instance, pick up a banana in your garden. I mean, that would be really, really exotic to pick up a, a banana here. Um, this is, this is brown bread country um, because we, are, we live so far up north that um that 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 we have a tradition of of brown bread and that makes me think because you're talking about the distinction between brown bread and white bread white fluffy bread which here is a representation of wealth yeah if you if you're able to eat white bread it's because you're wealthy because because rye grows natural and in abundance here wheat didn't now it's it's it is getting there but it but it didn't historically. So it was a representation of wealth. And that made me think that bread, when we talk about bread and design, we talk about food and design, but bread is design. Mm. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a representation, the form, the shape, the way it's, it's meant to last. It's food that is somehow designed to last. And in that respect, it becomes a representation, not only of a place, 
but also of a way of of um, process. Of make, yeah, exactly. Of a, of a process, and then a representation of of culture as well. And maybe maybe culture springs out of that instead of the other way around. I don't know if that's but chicken or the egg. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, Thomas, I'm completely into what you're saying because you know, for, I mean, exactly. Like the preserved bread comes along with, say, sea travel. It comes along with, say, colonization and longer process times with military going on long expeditions and needing a lot of stored food. It's, it's all a part of a history and one couldn't be possible with, I mean, maybe the bread invented the steam engine, you know. We don't, I mean, very much. Yeah. God knows. Yeah. There's a really good um, connotation with the steam engine, like with how bread invented technology. And following on from what Thomas was talking about the process, and it's kind of like a design methodology of experimentation with bread techniques. And the more you experiment, the more you come up with new bread. So um, it's kind of like the kitchen experimentation of bread making. Uh, the way that you need, uh, how, uh, how the dough itself, how thick, how thin, uh, the way you pour the water, it all creates different types of bread and different identities. And even if we try to make roti bread in France to this exact recipe in India, it will not taste the same because the site and the climate and all that takes a big part of it. So making bread is to, to go from that kind of departure point of bread making or making bread, not bread making, <laughs> making bread is a design process that involves experimentation of materiality, technology, and technique. And this is... Uh, a uh, uh, actually, in relation to that, uh, I, I am reminded of uh, cultural diffusion. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in uh, referring to the... Uh, the Philippines is not a bread-eating country. We are rice eaters, nice. as the rest of Asia. But of course, the bread is introduced to us through colonization. In that sense, the, 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 the concept or the culture of eating bread uh, as a, uh, what do you call this, a food for storage that uh, you can take when you travel, uh, it changes the culture of uh, bringing food, uh, bringing food in, du during travel in the Philippines. So, uh, of course now, uh, uh, bread is an uh, uh, integral part of our um, diet, but uh, uh, it, uh, and it illustrates how the culture was diffused from the west to the east. Of course, um, India is nearby, it's also uh, with the uh, uh, roti and chapati, and, and, uh, but uh, Philippines are familiar with the pizza, that uses uh, a non-like uh, dough spread with uh, toppings on top of it, it has uh, forgotten the origin of the idea in the Indian tradition. But it, the Italian way of pizza making, which is so uh, over, uh, over uh, uh, what do you call this? overstated or a popular culture, forgot the origin of eating bread in the uh, Near East tradition or in the Indian tradition. Okay, so it has commercialized the idea of a portable bed, a, por a portable diet, a portable bread that you can eat while walking or, or, or traveling. This is, uh, this is exactly what this project is all about. I mean, we've, we've provoked uh, the design process, bread make, uh, making bread as a design process, we provoked the travel of bread and its meaningfulness from one country to the next. As it travels, it changes uh, what it is. It changes its identity. This is exactly the point of departure for a research project, um, you know, bread, called breadcrumbs. If you're all game, we can, we can start writing it up. Um, <laughs> especially, especially now in this day and age, we, we need that meaningfulness into our we can't keep going with the same eating habits as we, we have for centuries. The planet is suffering, and like I said, our existence or the planet's existence. So if we can come up with new ways of uh, substituting bread for something else, but without telling people this is what we're doing, because you know we'll never make it to the end of the project if we did. <laughs> so uh, if you're all game, we can, we can start um. the webinar. I have another one question. Actually, I'm very happy that. Okay, yeah. 
please, please. Yeah, <laughs> I'm from Korea. And I, I'm very thanks for I can today join this uh, session. Uh, I need to asking about Professor Dori Dao. Yeah. At your uh, prank. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, excuse me. Uh, can I open? You can open the camera. Yeah, would love to see your face. I opened it, but I couldn't. <laughs> um, I don't know why. <laughs> I open it but I cannot uh, see my... Maybe face. turn on the light. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, you're right. Because we, uh, Korea right now, almost 11 o'clock. Gosh, night, yeah. yes. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I'm so pleasure to Hi. join this presentation. We can, we can hear you. We can hear Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very oh, much. Yeah. Okay. Do you have something, a uh, very special story? Mm -hmm. Uh, Professor uh, Dorida, do you know uh, in Korea brand, party baguette? Do you understand what I mean, party baguette? No. This is the party, party baguette. Party baguette, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. But the brand is Korea brand, uh, Korea brand. But the brand, uh, to be more bigger, so they moved to New York. So it is like a Starbucks. So they selling cafe and they selling uh, many type of uh, bread. So it is uh, uh, something uh, for me very fun because uh, the name is a party baguette. It is like a uh, Franks cultural things. Mm. But it the name. Uh, well, actually, the selling is not. Uh, really Franks uh, type of uh, bread. There have uh, some Asian type, uh, Asian type minis. They have inside some red bean uh, sweet, sweet things and some cream things and like yeah. uh, some Asian type uh, uh, bread. They selling, uh, they business, uh, they uh, produce a kind of this bread. But, uh, so they don't sell they don't sell baguettes they don't sell french baguettes but yeah. baguette, baguette yes right but but they not only selling to baguette they selling many different type of uh, bread so they're yeah. using the french brand to sell korean yeah. bread why do you think that is i'm going to ask you the question back at you <laughs> why do you think they need to use a uh, Paris in their bread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe it is because Paris is famous about the bread, bread. But, uh, but also actually near other many countries also they very famous uh, uh, different type of bread. For example, not only the uh, France uh, because there have many uh, country they. Uh, like the base base of a food for bread, but uh, I'm an Asian uh, Asian person, so base base food is rice. As uh, before, I so yeah. So uh, I don't know. Just uh, this is the not um, kind of a process of a bread uh, story, but this is something fun. Funnily happen well uh, grow to some business way to uh, uh, bread things. That's why I just, already I shared uh, some YouTube video, uh, right. how they selling in New York, New York. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, so, have a look at, I'll have a look at that. And this is, this is exactly what we're talking about because when we talk about we, what we talked about as a panel here, are authentic recipes that come from the heart of nations, basically, and they're thousands of years old. But you've got the other side of bread making, which is identityless. <laughs> we can say that that's a word, <laughs> has no identity. Um, it's really kind of like a white bread in terms of its identity, that it has no color, it has no nationality, and it can be, um, it can be associated with any, with any country. So, um, or it's kind of like a replica of the original recipe, but without the authentic taste that comes along with that. 
And this is exactly what we're talking about changing before we start changing the authentic recipes habits. This is where the bread distribution um, um, and the bread politics come into it because the variety of wheat that we're talking about, one variety of wheat, this is exactly where it goes. It goes into the mass production of bread um, without, without the nutritional value of bread. I don't want to name brands because this is going to go online. <laughs> But yeah, if we yeah. eat the gym food, for example, yeah. if we, um, you know, many breads that you eat are not really made out of bread, they're made of something else. So um, I would have to look at the Paris baguette to see what it is before I can comment on its authenticity or the I, taste. I but, worry about as you are origin person, I don't know how you will feel about this bread type, but uh, uh, I wish to you can watch in one time kind of a, this YouTube video, Party Baguette. And okay. I'll have a, I'll have a today presentation. And uh, actually, I'm not really speak well English person, so um, I'm sorry for I'm not well explained. But I really no, want to. <laughs> no, your English is very good. Yeah, we we understood what you were saying. Thank you for um, thank you for the reference. Well, I'll have a good one. Is it possible one more question about the uh, uh, Professor Lau? Uh, Professor Lau? Lolita? Or Raul? Ah, Raul. Yeah. Yes, yes. What was it? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what is the meaning about uh, in India, dal? Dal. Dal is made out of lentils. Lentil. So, lentil. Lentil. Yeah, it's normally lentil, lentil soup. It's normally oh. then various various kinds of lentil soup. It's dal is also dal. grain. So dal grows like a grain, and then you take it and you cook it. You slow cook it, and you can add some spices to it, or you can just cook it with a little bit of turmeric and salt, and that's what dal is. Again, it's the humble man and it's the poor man's diet, as they call in India. You know, dal roti. It is referred to as dal roti. So okay. with, with roti you have dal or with dal you have roti. So that's uh, that's the sort of use of dal. Uh, okay, uh, because uh, uh, actually I, this, in Korea also uh, we have a very famous uh, Indian restaurant. The name is dal. Well, oh. I, yeah, because Korea mean of dal is moon. Dal moon. is okay. Dal well, is basically. So it's one of the varieties through which it's, it's a kind of lentil. Moong is a kind yeah, of okay, lentil. I understood. I lentil. love the cultural exchange. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted something to uh, go yeah. you know, I just love that Philippine language. Uh, we were working on the Northeast and through a lot of discussions and a lot of projects that happen in the region, in Nagaland, Assam. Uh, one of the things I've always realized is that once you cross into a part of India, you're almost coming to the end of South Asia and the beginning of Southeast Asia. You know, And you enter a long patch from the, from the Northeast through Burma, Thailand, into Philippines, which is a rice, it's a different kind of culture of similar kind of trees, a uh, lot of animals uh, across similar kind of forests, uh, similar eating habits, like a lot of, in, like inside the tribes, a lot of um, uh, insects being consumed, dolly, so that is another side story, okay, uh, uh, about that, uh, that, that thing. And uh, it's interesting that that reimagination comes in. And here, uh, in that part of the world, white bread, as we know it, becomes like a, uh, become strictly associated with the modern colonial uh, coming into the land. While till uh, Calcutta, like almost till Calcutta and the rest of India, because roti, bread as such, is also associated with a lot of local indigenous cultures as the main food. And then slowly that you know, morphs, and that's how the map also was imagined by me and Mahi, that rice uh, coming on the east. Um, 
Absolutely, Raul. Like this is, I, as you're talking about food, about the landscape, and I'm just in my head, I'm getting the transformation of the landscape as you transform food identities. And then on the right, uh, the right. From Jerusalem to Philippines. <laughs> yeah. so that is fantastic, right? Syria to Philippines. Well, start sketching what you were talking about. Uh, actually, I was about to uh, insert uh, the migration theory according to food. <laughs> food <laughs> as migration theory. Migration <laughs> theory, you know, from uh, what Rahul said from, uh, from uh, the Near East to the South East, how food transforms and mutates and creates its own identity as you have posited in your presentation. So it, it's, it's reflective of how the uh, how population of the earth takes shape like the origin of um, we can actually posit that uh, people when they uh, disperse <laughs> they carry with them the food and the food is uh, has evolved the identity depending on the ingredients that is available so insects <laughs> versus uh, uh, animals when insects are abundant rather than you know the grazing uh, animals of the land. So I, 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 I think that's the direction of the, the breadcrumbs is to retrace history through the transformation of the bread, which is a staple food. Um, actually, we, we do have a version of bread, but uh, it's not the bread. We have uh, rice bread. We have rice bread, but not, not as... Uh, we need to see a webinar. From <laughs> no, the rice bread. <laughs> I think that's your next. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of interesting food in the Philippines. I, I'm sure you have heard of our exotic food, like the balut and the other foods that are um, uh, might be a culturally shocking for from another end of the the plant, uh, the the earth. Uh, so it's 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 more of uh, not making do with what we have, but it's I think it's cultural. Our, our predisposition to something uh, that has been um, an integral part of the culture and our palate. I'm looking forward to hearing your webinar in the next one. <laughs> in the next one. <laughs> The food culture, the food culture, food culture in the Philippines. Uh, well, that's absolutely. a very, absolutely. it's a general, it's a very wide topic, but I, I would, uh, I would like to uh, contribute to the discussion in the future. Send us, send us your uh, expression of interest and, and we'll, we'll make it happen. I'm sure that, <laughs> you know, let us know the date where you would like to post um, and and we'll just book you a session in our uh, carrot bar. Great. Easy. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. But I think um, we still have about uh, 10 minutes to go, but, you know, with something to, to share about the food journey, I think we have established that as food changes, the landscape changes. So food identities change as it travels uh, across landscapes. And it's something that brings community together. We're all talking the common language of flour, some kind of flour, salt and water. And we're all made from that across continents. If anything's going to bring humanity together, it would be the bread making or making bread. So, so reflection, food for thought, as Ia always says. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our new project. This is the food project that we want to go for, the research project. So um, I, I, I just have to say last words from my side that I want to thank you all for making it today. I do hope that it was useful and informative for you as it was for us. And we just wanted to start the discussion. I know we did not cover every single aspect about Lebanese pita or the French baguette, or the roti, um, you know, but we just wanted to give you a little appetizer to show you the potential where you could actually go after this. We could start a webinar, webinar series with the intention of creating a research project after that, that um, I actually have an eye on a European project 
um, uh, Erasmus strategy where you've got three, two partners, European partners and two non-European partners, and we could go for this kind of uh, research project if uh, anyone is interested. Spread the word, ask them to share their food and bread stories with us. They don't have to be big academic stories. Family stories are fine because this is where the real meaningfulness of um, community is in the family. Perfect. Raul and I decided the floor for you to say your few words before we close the. What thank you so much, Dolly. Thank you. And uh, as I said, for me, the story is far from over. I'm uh, doing a lot more research on it. In fact, I have some of my students working on uh, one of the forms of bread in Western India called the pao, which is more like a bun. So uh, maybe we can utilize that in some form and we can certainly explore the corn and millet and all that. And Look yeah. at the Russian black bread, and there, there are immense possibilities, I think. Absolutely. So thank, you. thank you for all of us, uh, and thank you, Aya, for giving us this platform. So, <laughs> all the best. <laughs> Hi, and as Dolly was uh, winding up, I, I, was, I was reminded of Aya and how uh, what I was missing is her stress on policy and uh, which is constantly what she brings in. And I was wondering that you know, how we, for design world, uh, use uh, people like in government or in human bodies to generate dialogues with industries and corporates to begin platforms in which this, this discussions can actually uh, reach some uh, prototyping points, some futurition points, some models can be developed and uh, so I thought and I, either way at the by, very end the ball had to be passed to the court. so the ball is being passed and uh, bye bye is from my side uh, it's been great being a part of the panel and uh, more food stories soon absolutely I actually took a screenshot for our Facebook uh, <laughs> for our Facebook working group I can I get everyone's permission that you're okay if we show your name and your picture. Uh, I was busy doodling bread and rotis here in my little diary while you were taking the screenshot. Right. Okay, show me, show me. And maybe maybe yeah. we can have more videos on. Yeah. Yeah, we can we can have a photo shoot, like in a group let's have, photo. Yeah, let's have the videos. Everybody on. coming on. <laughs> I lower my, my people who stayed right till the end. We should okay. have all the young right. students who works with us on this. Yeah, they're all there. I can see them. One. Yeah. Bread. Srinidhi, you can also switch on video. If you don't put your video now, forever hold your peace. That's it. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> Go. Bread. One, two, three. Bread. 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 Okay. This is for our Facebook page. Thank you all for Where's coming. Anna? Here. Thank, Thank you, Raul and Lolita. And we'll see you in the next webinar. Cool. <laughs> um, and... I wonder who the next webinar is going to be. Yeah. Can, I, can I say something? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. hi. Uh, the next webinar will be the uh, 27th uh, of October. Yeah, yeah, I've got it in my diary. I was going to yeah. confirm with you this week, but thank you for confirming to me. Yeah, so we will try again. We, we tried for two weeks ago, but uh, the stuff wasn't going out like we wanted. So we try again the 26th of, of October there. No problem. If you want to have a little test beforehand, let me know, we can organize a meeting. Yeah, but it was uh, the net uh, from the whole town that was down on that day. So yeah, that's the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, That's what happens. Hey, yeah. hey, Aya here. Mette is based in Kolding in Denmark, so that everybody can catch up, place yeah. your, your thoughts and, and uh, future plans. So Kolding, Denmark, different school Kolding. Yes. So we'll meet at the latest with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and if we, if we just define bread as being a process, so is a webinar. Okay. I love that. <laughs> I love that because you're creating a provocation for people that don't disagree with us that haven't made it to this webinar. Good one. I like it. <laughs> yes. Let's see you then.
Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you in the next session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The internet is a fantastic place. Loved it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> New digital world. <laughs> Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye.